Rub up your engines! Well, it looks like the Chinese have it right, if you ask me. There's a Wuling EV, a little electric car. You can get four people in it, and it sells for less than $5,000. Now, you can only buy it in China so far, but interestingly enough, 44% of this company, Wuling, is owned by General Motors. You know, GM makes a lot of cars in China. They make a lot of Chevy cars in China. They own 44% of this little company. Now, they're little cars. They can go up to 60 miles an hour. They're made for driving in the city, and it really makes sense. They have electric cars in the city. You know, you can drive so many miles, but you're not even going to drive nearly that every day. And since they're small cars, guess what? They recharge faster because they got smaller batteries. I got this electric scooter here that the Chinese gave me to try out. It's called Fat Gator. <laughs> I get big fat tires, right? And I have fun with it. But I plug it in at night in the morning, it's all charged up. Things got a range of like, I don't know, they said 50, but I think it's more like 40 miles. I go to the beach, have some fun with it, and it's got the gauge, so you know when you're getting less than halfway, before you get to halfway, it's time to turn around and go back. It's fine for little short trips, beach, inner city or stuff, but not over long periods of time. I just had a viewer come over with a car the other day, and he said they had friends in Salt Lake City that bought one of those Audi electric cars that cost a fortune, right? And they only had it a year. And finally, it was like New Year's, they were coming back, and it kept dying, dying, dying. It ran out of electricity three miles from their house. It was freezing cold. The heat had cut off earlier, because when it starts running out of power, it'll turn things off, including the heat. They abandoned it three miles from their house, and then the next day, they had a tow to the Audi dealer and said, we don't want this pile of crap. Trade in it for something else. Of course, they lost a shirt on the deal, but they realized the range of those things, especially live in a cold place like Utah in the winter, where the range is nothing compared to what it says. They said they had plenty of range according to the computer to make it from where they were going to their house, but it didn't even make it. Big electric cars, maybe stupid. Small ones, much better idea. 10524 says, should I get a 2008 Chevy Malibu? I see one for sale on a private party with 20,000 miles for 14.5. Looks in great condition. Mechanic says it's good. I plan on buying it and trading it later. The current owner's selling it because they're looking to get an SUV. What should I do? Well, one, normally, I would say never buy a Chevy Malibu. They aren't very good vehicles. But if that's the real mileage, and there's absolute proof, you want absolute positive proof, that's the real mileage, and they're the original owner. If you can get that kind of proof, what the heck? Because the price of used cars are so high, you probably could drive it. You only put a few miles on it and sell it and break even or maybe even make a little bit of money. I can't forecast the future, neither can you. Let's say you're talking about keeping it for two years or three years. I don't know what the market's going to be like. Then the market might collapse and you may find out that that car's going to go for five grand and you'd lose a fortune. If you're talking short term, go right ahead. Next few months, I don't think anything's going to change. But if you're talking years, then you're gambling with 14.5 on a junky car. But as it stands today, people pay so much money for them and you want it, go ahead. And if you're going to sell it in a short period of time, just make sure you got insurance to cover it and make sure that the insurance will pay you what you paid for it. Get an evaluation of the car done to make sure because they might say, oh, Oh, that's a piece of junk car. It's five years old. Hey, you know, we'll give you six grand for it. You never know. You got to get the evaluation on your insurance policy to make sure you're not going to lose money. Milk Train says my 02 Chevy has PO420 and PO300. It misses horribly. It runs okay on the highway, but going under 40, it misses horribly. I put new spark plugs in. What could it be? You're in a position where. Which came first, the chicken or the egg, right? Because the PO420 could cause the PO300. Or the PL300 could cause the PL420. The PL420 is inefficient catalytic converter, while the PL300 is random intermittent misfires. If you have a bad catalytic converter, it's clogged up, it can cause misfires. But more commonly, it's the PL300 car. You got something that's causing a misfire, and then it says the catalytic converter is inefficient because if your car is misfiring, you're going to get some raw gas. The raw gas is going to make the catalytic converter work poorly because it's going to overwhelm it. The catalytic converters burn on burn hydrocarbons, raw gasoline, on burn gasoline. But if there's too much, if it's overwhelmed, and then it's going to trip the code for it's working inefficiently. More often, it's a misfire. Now, it's an O2 Chevy. You said you change the spark plugs. You want to check the wires, ignition coils. But it can also be the fuel injectors. If your fuel injectors drip fuel, it will misfire. And that's often what will happen. You say at high speeds, it's OK. But at low speeds, it isn't. At high speeds, your fuel injectors are spraying so much fuel. And if they drip a little too much, it's OK. But at low speeds, if it drips extra fuel, it'll run worse. So I'm assuming you got a fuel injection problem. Now, sometimes cleaning them, 
you get lucky. And my friend Bernie in Albuquerque, he's got that ATS, automotive test solutions. You get a bottle of cleaner, put it in the tank. I've seen it do miracles, the fuel injection. Fuel injectors that are carboned up and dripping and doodling, it'll clean them right out. Just driving a couple hundred miles with a can of that cleaner and a tank of gas. You never know. I don't know. It's worth trying that first because normally the PO300 is going to cause the PO420 inefficient cap. That's how it almost always works on Chevrolet's. JC412 says, I got a 2009 Mazda RX-8. The battery drains over extended periods of time. It will drain if it sits for four days. Now, I did an alternator test and found my alternator showing 12.7 volts while it was running. What could be Wrong. One, your alternator isn't putting enough enough electricity. It should be 13 point something. 12.7 is way too low. You got to understand one thing about car batteries. Car batteries, they call them 12 volts. They're not really 12 volt batteries. They have the normal ones have six sets of cells and each is 2.2 volts. So do the math. That's 13.2 volts. And your thing's only charging at 12.7. So the alternator's not charging right. But, but, and this is a big deal, before you do anything, have the battery load tested. Because if your battery is shot, the alternator can't charge it enough electricity. It'll charge at 12.7, but it won't go higher because the battery's too shot. Have the battery tested first, load tested. Any mechanic can do it. Any auto parts store can do it. it. Takes two minutes, right? And if the battery's bad, put it in, you'll probably find out your problems will go away. And it's easy to tell that. Put a new battery in, then test the charging. You see, it's 13 point something, you know? The whole thing was the battery. Now, if the battery tests okay, then your alternator shot. Or the wiring between the battery and the alternators got problems like corrosion or it's shorting out. But a lot of times it's just the battery, because if it's a really bad battery, that's exactly what'll happen. Hurricane Mike says, how can I siphon gasoline for my vehicles? I own a 13 Accord and a 17 CRV. I live in hurricane prone Florida. I keep my vehicle takes full in case we have to hit the road. I like to siphon gas from, but I know there's anti-siphon devices. What can I do? Well, unfortunately, when you try to put a siphon in, they got little valves that block it. That's just how they are these days. So the only thing you can possibly do is if you get a thinner siphon hose and get a big funnel, you know when you put the gas pump into your car, all right, it pushes that little piece, right? Well, if you get a funnel that goes through maybe this long and will push and open that up, it would be a thinner hose, it would take longer to siphon it up, but still you'd be able to siphon it up because the funnel would hold it and you could fit it through the middle of the funnel. Otherwise, if you stick something in, it'll either not make it through or it'll get stuck and kinked by the flap and you won't be able to suck anything and then you'll have to reach in there and try to push the flap and pull it out. You get a funnel that's big enough, with a big enough internal, you get a thin little hose to go in it. That would actually work. Other Kevin says, can I get a louder turn signal from my 93 Chevy Silverado? I'm an old guy and I can't hear the thing clicking. What can I do to make it make a louder noise? All right, well, that is the turn signal relay. We used to call them turn signal flashers because they made it flash, right? But now everything's got a different name. Now it's a turn signal relay. Go to a place and say you want the loudest possible one you can get. And there are places that can sell you one that makes a little bit more noise. That has a louder click to it. You can even get one custom made. It's just an on-off relay. It wouldn't be that hard to do, you know. My advice, too, is you got a choice of metal and plastic, get the metal one. The metal one's going to make more noise than the plastic one does. You know, it's just simple. Plugs in and out. Call around. And you might even Google it, too, and say, loud turn signal for this. And they get you one you put in, you'll probably find it'll be clicking away. Most people want quieter ones. But if you want a louder one, hey, there's always somebody out there that's got one. It's just got the prongs to plug in and out. It takes two seconds to change the stupid thing out. Well, I tell you, people don't know how to drive standard transmissions anymore? Well, there's a guy in Florida who bought one of those classic Ford GTs. He bought it at the Barrett auction for $704,000 and he smashed it up immediately saying he wasn't familiar with a standard transmission. The guy was 50 years old. He spent a seven hundred four grand for this car. He's driving in Florida and he ran into a palm tree with it in second gear. <laughs> Now, he said it was a combination of, he's unfamiliar with the standard transmission, uh, a wet road, old tires, mud, and he just had it detailed. Well, I do have to say one thing. When we have fanatic about your car, 
and you even put wax on the tires? Not such a smart thing because it makes them slip. You get any on the tread and if you've got a car that's made for cornering you'll notice the side of your tires have a little bit of tread on them. You get polish on that guess it's gonna slide. Well he ran right into the tree. He really smashed that $704,000 car up. Now the guy was 50 years old. You know, that's what's so funny. I'm 69, right? I guess he's a young and, and he never learned how to drive a standard transmission now. <laughs> The hilarious thing is the guy was driving with a suspended driver's license and this car wasn't even registered for the road yet. No, I suppose the guy can afford a $704,000 car. He'll have a snazzy lawyer or pay some fine or something. I just find it hilarious. The guy spent all that money for a car and didn't even know how to drive it. Now, that's an actual racing car. You got to know what you're doing. Some clown gets in it and starts going around. He ran into a palm tree. You couldn't make a better story up if you tried. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.